Hello, everyone. This is Danny Haifong, and you are listening or watching a reading of one of my published articles, this time in my own Patreon blog at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. And this article was republished in Black Agenda Report on November 10th, 2021, and it's titled On American Patriotism, a Marxist Polemic. And this article is very important because there's a debate about the relevance of American patriotism in the struggle for socialism in the United States. And uh, this debate has many sides to it. And I take a particular position where I argue that uh, American patriotism is inherently nationalist, no matter how uh, much people try to explain that away. I argue that all ideology has materialist origins, that is, is rooted in the real world. And so we have to start from there when we are talking about American patriotism. And so let's get to the article so I can explain further. The embrace of American patriotism, the article begins. What some are calling proletarian patriotism within online circles is yet another attempt to rebrand American nationalism. It is similar in character, but different in form to the ongoing effort to rebrand the two-party system through the development of a so-called socialist bloc within the Democratic Party's corporate jaws. Ideology in both cases is rendered an abstraction rather than a reflection of the material conditions of society. The Democratic Party is a capitalist-owned party and therefore cannot but serve the interests of the capitalist class. American patriotism is an outgrowth of the U.S.'s peculiar form of imperialism and therefore cannot be divorced from its reactionary nationalist and racist roots. Analyzing ideology from its materialist origins is a major component of the Marxist philosophy of dialectical materialism and is relevant not just to patriotism, but any concept. In answering socialists who decried the concept of authority, quote unquote, Frederick Engels stated such activists, quote, think that they, when they have changed the names of things, they have changed the things themselves. Engels goes on to explain that the material conditions define how authority or the imposition of one's will upon others is expressed in the real world. To give an example, the state under capitalism enforces the authority of the capitalist class vis-a-vis -vis the state. Under socialism, Engels says, the state remains a mechanism of suppression, but this time to enforce the authority of the working class over the capitalists. Similarly, the concept of patriotism holds a definitive meaning in the context of the United States, which is not fundamentally transformed by placing socialist or proletarian in front of it. Socialist patriots assert that their patriotism means one uh, love for one's own people and specify that they celebrate the resistance of the workers as the primary expression of the ideology. Some who ascribe to this tendency don't deny that patriotism in the United States emerged from a bourgeois society whose origins rest in slavery, genocide, and white supremacy, all of which remain significant to the United States' current stage of development. Now, they don't always acknowledge that, but I digress. However, socialist patriots claim that the material basis of American patriotism is bourgeois nationalism is actually a secondary phenomenon to their scheme of the ideology. Again, socialist patriots claim that the material basis of American patriotism in bourgeois nationalism is secondary to their schema of the ideology. Such a claim is an affront to dialectical materialism. Racism and imperialism cannot be denounced on the one hand and their ideological expression, American patriotism, embraced on the other. American patriotism has always been the property of the U.S. ruling class. How Ho Chi Minh, Vladimir Lenin, or any other revolutionary, domestically or globally leveraged patriotic sentiment in the United States does not change its fundamental character. Ho Chi Minh spoke in admiration of the U.S.'s founding principles upon the declaration of an independent Vietnam in 1945, not because he was a firm supporter of American patriotism, but because he understood that the opportunity had arisen to leverage the U.S.'s competition with France over colonial possessions during World War II to the benefit of the National Liberation Movement. The same goes for Lenin's appeal to great Russians to oppose the Tsar and Russia's imperialist participation in the First World War. 
Both Ho Chi Minh and Vladimir Lenin, however, were very clear in distinguishing between bourgeois nationalism and revolutionary nationalism rooted in the struggle for self-determination of oppressed nations. Patriotism denoted a different meaning within the colonial and semi-feudal contexts of Vietnam and Imperial Russia, what would become the USSR. Lenin's impression on Ho Chi Minh led the Vietnamese revolutionary to declare, quote, only socialism and communism can liberate the oppressed nations and working people throughout the world from slavery. Patriotism in Vietnam was an expression of revolutionary nationalism, the project of liberating the nation from a, the brutal oppression and exploitation of the European and Japanese colonial project. In pre-revolutionary Russia, national liberation and patriotism meant developing the requisite unity among several nationalities to overthrow the still underdeveloped capitalist state while respecting at the same time the self-determination for oppressed nationalities who suffered the most under bourgeois rule. It should come as no surprise then that Ho Chi Minh and Lenin were devout internationalists whose works were applied with greatest effectiveness in the non-white colonized nations often referred to as the underdeveloped world. Inspiration from Lenin and Uncle Ho's legacy also extended into the West, where communists of all races have spent more than a century fighting for socialism in the citadels of the imperial orbit. But Lenin provided specific guidance for revolutionaries around the national question, which remains relevant in the present moment. In his work on socialism and self-determination, Lenin explains, quote, The proletariat of the oppressor nations cannot remain silent on the frontiers of a state founded upon national oppression, a question so unpleasant for the imperialist bourgeoisie. The proletariat must struggle against the enforced retention of oppressed nation within the bounds of a given state, which means they must fight for self-determination. The proletariat must demand freedom of political separation for the colonies and nations oppressed by their own nation. Otherwise, the international internationalism of the proletariat would be nothing but empty words. American patriotism is by definition bourgeois nationalism from the vantage point of U.S. capitalist development in its particular form of national oppression. The so-called culture, quote-unquote, of the United States is a byproduct of colonialism and empire. The American flag, for example, connotes freedom for the capitalist oppressor and the boundaries of settler colonialism and exploitation for oppressed nations. This includes black people and indigenous people, who, by Lenin's analysis of the national question, comprise of oppressed nations within the United States. While anyone can subjectively redefine American patriotism for the presumed purpose of winning over American workers, the principal contradiction of American nation building is empire, war, racism, and genocide. The brutally racist conditions that have been justified in the name of American patriotism cannot simply be pushed into the background so that a new, more comforting definition can come to the foreground. To do so is an act of revisionism. Furthermore, it is important to acknowledge that the material conditions which have given rise to this attempt to rebrand American patriotism for the purposes of caste struggle are very real. Donald Trump's success with the so-called working class a white American population and the Democratic Party's role in the U.S.'s race to the bottom austerity regime has much to do with the rise in quote unquote America first attitudes. The Democratic Party has neutralized the left and steered numerous movements, including the movement for black self determination, into its massive political graveyard. A political vacuum has emerged from the decay of U.S. imperialism, which is characterized by a wholesale bandying of ideas within a context of reaction. This has led to distortions, such as believing that working-class victories achieved during the labor struggles of the early 20th century are a reflection of the true greatness of quote-unquote America, and therefore form the basis of real American patriotism. In other words, if we simply remember and apply the greatness of the American working class, then the United States can be great again. The problems with this formulation are numerous. First, the United States was never great, which is hardly controversial. Second, there is no singular, quote-unquote, American working class, as the United States is a prison house of nations. Third, no material basis exists 
for drawing direct association between movements against oppress, oppression with the oppress, oppressor nation that produces such movements prior to revolutionary victory. In other words, the material basis does not exist for drawing an association between movements against oppression with the oppressor nation, which produces these movements until we have a revolutionary victory. So any subsumption of the broad mass of workers under the banner of patriotism is a subjective decision driven by emotions that are rooted in loyalty to American exceptionalism. The first duty of a revolutionary is to tell the truth. The truth is that class unity will not be achieved by quote-unquote loving America, a settler colony, and an imperialist empire, but through the development of class solidarity around concrete issues that sharpen the contradiction between the oppressed and the bourgeoisie. Patriotism does not provide guidance for how to secure self-determination for oppressed nations, food for the hungry people, living wages for the mass of workers, or address any other class question. In fact, American patriotism is the ideological entry point for all forms of U.S.-imposed oppression due to its usefulness to the U.S. ruling class project of disguising the imperatives of capital under the unifying banner of the quote-unquote nation. A new culture, a revolutionary culture, arises from struggle. The works of Emilcar Cabral, Franz Fanon, and countless other revolutionary leaders of the anti-colonial and socialist movement make this point clear. Emilcar Cabral explains that, quote, The liberation struggle must bring diverse interests into harmony, resolve contradictions, and define common objectives in search of liberty and progress. The taking to heart of its objectives by large strata of the population, reflected in their determination in the face of difficulties and sacrifices, is a great political and moral victory. It is also a cultural achievement to, of decisive importance for the subsequent development and success of the liberation movement. The greater the differences between the culture of the dominated people and the culture of the oppressor, the more possible such a victory becomes. Of course, the United States is not an oppressed nation like Guinea-Bissau or Cape Verde, but an empire in decline. And please, for all those faux communists out there, do not call me a third worldist because you are not understanding what I am saying here. I'm saying the United States is not an oppressed nation. This is not third worldism. This is a materialist analysis of the United States of America, an empire in decline. What we can learn from Cabral, however, is that the backwards ideas which are embraced by the masses, the backward ideas which are embraced by the masses can only be resolved in the practice of struggle. The embrace of American patriotism has divorced the ideology from its objective historical context. Frank Chapman notes in his work, Marxist-Leninist Perspectives on Black Liberation and Socialism, that this era, error became increasingly significant following the demise of the first international, a phenomenon that gave rise to the rightist tendency to look upon black people as merely members of the working class while subordinating racial oppression and Jim Crow fascist rule to problems of the working class as a whole. This pattern was corrected by the Third International under Lenin's leadership when the influence of the historic struggle of black people themselves as a nation within a nation made self-determination a key programmatic priority of the global, the world socialist movement. It appears that the so-called, quote-unquote, American left is in need of another course correction. American patriotism is not merely a bourgeois deviation, but a distraction from the task at hand. Class unity among workers is achieved only through concrete struggle around common interests. American patriotism has zero utility in this regard. White communists and communists within oppressor countries should focus on applying the national question and Lenin's work on self-determination to the current period. The Black Lives Matter movement and a renewed interest in the word socialism in the United States indicate that more white Americans on the left are willing to engage in united class struggle with respect to the national question. Still, ideologi ideological battles over the utility of American patriotism reveal how the primacy of Yankee ideology continues to place barriers in front of the class struggle in the United States. Black revolutionary and prison movement leader George Jackson often discussed the relevance of these barriers to the challenge of uniting 
prisoners across all races around improving living conditions behind the walls of the prison. He left us with the following words to reflect on. Quote, I'm always telling the brothers, some of those whites are willing to work with us against the pigs. All they got to do is stop talking honky. End quote. That does it for this reading of one of my published articles, this time in my own personal blog, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong, and it was republished in Black Agenda Report on November 10th, 2021, and um, I highly encourage you to read the article and as well to support the work. Make sure that you, if you are able, support me on patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. And you can, of course, subscribe to Black Agenda Report as well. Thank you so much. And until next time.